Graham mentioned Cameron Zagar, I'm a urologist working in Oakland, also I'm a senior lecturer at the university where I do teaching and research in urology-based topics. I'm just going to talk about uh, briefly about some new diagnostic tests, some relatively new staging tests, not much about the PSMA and lutetium, which we discussed earlier, and some relatively new uh, developments in terms of treatment for both local prostate cancer as well as more advanced disease. So as we all know, early detection of prostate cancer is currently mainly based on PSA testing, which is a blood test. But this PSA test, we use a specific cutoff point, often around four, to decide PSA is abnormal, and then we use that as a basis to do a biopsy on patients. But at PSA of four, only around 25% of patients will have actual cancer if we go and biopsy all of them. So, so it means based on this criteria, we end up doing a lot of biopsies for patients, which is potentially unnecessary. And at the same time, we probably will miss some cancers in a number of patients who have cancer with lower PSA numbers. So because of that, there has been a lot of research into looking at better ways of uh, improving our blood tests for detecting PSA for prostate cancer. And one area is that when we look at PSA in blood, if you look at it more closely, it's actually the test that we detect is made up of a number of smaller components in the blood that make up the whole PSA test that we detect. So people have looked at different components separately. So if they look at smaller combination of tests, whether that can be more effective in predicting the risk of prostate cancer in someone. And based on this, there are some new tests available. Some of these have been around for four or five years. Some of them are relatively new. The first such test was called prostate health index test, which was used in people who have elevated PSA, and they were candidates for biopsy. But instead of going directly to biopsy, they would have this test. And based on the results of this single blood test, up to around 36% of patients could avoid having a biopsy because the test would suggest the risk of cancer is low. Another similar test is the 4K score, which is relatively more uh, recently available. And this uses a combination of same components in blood as well as DRE and other examination findings. And again, using this test alone, we can avoid biopsy in up to 40% of patients. The newest test, which is called ISO-PSA, again, it uh, uses the same concept of using smaller components of uh, PSA in the blood. And the researchers suggest that it can avoid BOPs in up to 45% of patients. And at the same time, it may miss very few cancers. There also have been new developments in terms of urine tests, which can detect put prostate cancer. Probably one of the best ones that's currently being developed and it's going to the latest stages of trial is called Select MDX. And what this test does is that it detects specific genomic markers of prostate cancer in the urine. And based on that, the developers suggest that if the test is negative, then we have over 95% confidence that the patients don't have cancer. So it can potentially avoid biopsy in a whole lot of patients if the test is negative, which is very exciting. And it's so accurate that they are marketing it as liquid biopsy. The test costs around 200 US dollars currently. So that's potentially something that we could have available in the future. <clears throat> Besides diagnostic tests, there have been also a lot of new developments in imaging, which we saw earlier in terms of PSMA. Uh, but in terms of screening or early detection, MRI has become, has take, you know, has become more prominent in, in screening for prostate cancer. And MRI is a technology which has been around for many years, but in more recent times, the technology has developed and become more accurate, and also we've developed better understanding of prostate cancer. So these are a couple of MRI pictures that we can see that with good quality MRIs and adequate preparation, we can detect specific areas that potentially concerning for cancer. So that big spot over there, so that area there, and also potentially this spot over here. 
we can use that information when it comes to deciding who needs to have biopsy. And there's been a recent study which has looked at this. Normally, we say somebody has abnormal PSA, and then we go and do biopsy on them. But if we do that, we end up doing a whole lot of biopsies unnecessarily, and also we're going to miss some cancers in patients. One other op alternative is that once somebody has an abnormal PSA, we do an MRI on them. Because we know that MRI has a good chance of ruling out cancer, if the MRI is positive, we can say that patient has around 50% chance of having cancer. And if it's negative, we can say up to 90% chance that they don't have cancer. So by adding the MRI to the diagnostic pathway, we can potentially avoid biopsying in around 30% of patients. Not only that, we can actually detect more significant cancer in those that we biopsy. So essentially, MRI can help us do fewer biopsies, but at the same time, detect more cancers. And adding to the MRI picture is new technology, which is combination of MRI and ultrasound fusion. And what the technology does is that patients have a, have a MRI some weeks or months before the procedure, and then the MRI information is passed on to the machine, and the patient come in normally when they come for the biopsies, and they have an ultrasound. But the technology will combine the information from the MRI into the live ultrasound machine at the time of the biopsy, and it will mark the spots that the MRI said is suspicious for cancer. So what that means is that the surgeon can direct the needle biopsy to that specific area, making sure that we biopsy that spot that we thought is suspicious in the first place. Essentially what this means is that we can maximize the accuracy of, the, of our MRI and also of our biopsies. One area which is, I think is very exciting in terms of diagnosis and staging of cancer is genomic testing. So as we heard earlier, and this is simplifying it by a great deal, we, have, we, we get a biopsy sample which is around two centimeters and very small. The pathologists will look at it on the microscope and they, as we discussed as saw earlier, they will look at the patterns on how the cells look under a microscope and based on that, we decide that if a disease is aggressive or it's not aggressive. So, but there may be better ways of predicting aggressiveness of the cancer and that's looking at the genes that produce a specific pattern. So looking at the blueprints of the cells rather than how they look like under microscope. And there's been a lot of development in, in medicine in this field. And for, you, for prostate cancer, we currently have four different tests which look at this. The first one is called Confirmed DX, which <coughs> is a test which is based on biopsy tissue. And it's used in patients who've had prostate biopsy and the biopsy is negative for cancer. So what the, this confirmed DX does is that it will tell us with more accuracy whether the diagnosis is actually negative or whether patients still have higher risk of having cancer and they need to be further investigated. Second test is called Oncotype DX, and this is again performed on patients who've had biopsies, but the patients who've had, they've had cancer found in those biopsies. And those cancers which are glycine, six or glycine seven. And the test will tell us with accuracy whether this cancer is actually a low risk cancer, it's something that we can observe, or whether it's a cancer that needs to be treated. And based on this, we can potentially avoiding, avoid treatment in a number of patients. Simi another similar test is called Polaris, which is identical to Oncotype DX. It just uses a different set of genes, but has the same message. It will help us decide whether an a Gleason 6 or a Gleason 7 cancer is actually low risk and whether we can observe those cancer instead of treating them. And the fourth test has two components. One is similar to the other two, will tell us whether a cancer is actually low risk or not. And the second one is performed on patients who've had radical prostatectomy and will, will help us predict whether the cancer is likely to come back and whether we should give patients radiation sooner rather than later. There's also been a lot of development in prostate cancer treatment, both with surgery or other intervention as well as radiation. I'll talk about a couple of things today which I find more interesting. I'm sure we all heard about prostate surgery. And over the past 10 or 15 years, robotic surgery has become really popular in treating prostate cancer. In, traditionally, we would make a cut in the lower abdomen and we would do the operation open. 
Robotic surgery help us doing it through keyhole operation, essentially. Prostate surgery, again, highly simplified is we remove the prostate and we'll suture the end of the bladder back to the urethra again. With robotic surgery, uh, instead of making a cut, we place some you know, metallic ports inside the abdomen. Then the robot has these four arms. They are locked into these ports, and then the surgeon sits next to the robot on a console and controls the, the, the device, basically. There are these handheld joystick-like things that surgeons hold, and he, surgeons' movements correspond to the movement of the instruments inside the patient. And at the same time, surgeon has a three-dimensional view of the operation. The newer technology for robotic surgery is moved away from using the five different holes, and they can, we, there are devices that do the operation through a single opening. The latest one is that there's only one arm, and everything is done through a single opening, where the camera and the other instruments come through a small hole. Obviously, with everything in medicine, there's always a question of cost and benefit, and robotic surgery is probably the most, one of the more controversial issues, at least in New Zealand. Although it's available worldwide and available to public in UK, Australia, and <coughs> Europe, unfortunately, we don't have it currently available in New Zealand for public. Another new treatment that has become available is high-intensity focus ultrasound, which uses concentration of ultrasound waves to heat the cancer cells and eventually destroy them. This is very new and has been given approval by the US Food and Drug Administration around early last year. And what the technology involves is there's a machine that patients come in, they have the ultrasound probe inserted next to the prostate, and the device will use ultrasound to hit the prostate, identify where the cancer is, and treat them. The advantage is that it can be used for new diagnosis of cancer. It can also be used in patients who've had radiation before and have recurrence of the cancer. The way it works focally, we can treat the whole gland, only half of the prostate, or only like particular specific area that we know there is cancer in. Although, I should say that this is still considered to be experimental by many people, and there isn't enough evidence to suggest that it should be in for worldwide use. And lastly, um, there have been a lot of developments in new treatments for more advanced or metastatic cancer. And interestingly, there are not only new drugs which are being developed, we're also finding that if we use the same drugs that we know of differently, we can actually improve outcomes much you know, in patients. And there are two examples. One is Docetaxel, which is a drug, it's an IV chemotherapy which has been available for more than 10 years. But in the last couple of years, we found that, and it was usually given to patients quite late, at the very late stage of their prostate cancer. But now no, we know that if we give the same drug to patients much earlier, it can improve their survival quite significantly. So it's study showed that that improved survival by around 17 months, which is higher than any other treatment that we've seen in metastatic prostate cancer. Another even more recent study just published in the last couple of months is that use of abiraterone, which is a tablet, often used, uh, again, in more advanced prostate cancer quite late. We know that if you use it much earlier now, we can improve survival in a lot of the patients. There are also new developments in immunotherapy. <clears throat> and essentially what they do is similar to what we saw before, we give the own body the tools it needs to fight the cancer. And there are lots of lots of studies. There are over 100 new studies being developed in this field. One of them is this Prostevac. And so, in conclusion, there are a lot of different tests, a lot of different options are becoming available. And our challenge really is to decide which one are beneficial, if they improve the quality of life of our, of our patients as well, and whether and how we should make them available in New Zealand. Thank you.